uh, Gary Armstrong. We got George Braxton. We got Eldridge Coles. Eldridge, you're here still. Yes. And we've got um, Ian Milliken and me, the chair, Ben Campbell. And um, I think that's enough of that. And we will go with public comments. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Ms. Rose Page. Good morning. I will begin this with the reading of the announcement for a virtual meeting. This meeting is being conducted virtually in compliance with the City of Richmond Ordinance Number 2020-093. This public notice, meeting agenda, and agenda attachments for this May 18th, 2021 standing meeting of the boards of GRTC, Ride Finders, and Old Dominion Transit Management Company were posted on May 14th at ridegrtc.com. For the meeting notice, all written comments received via email by Carrie Rose Pace prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting were provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting and are read during the public comment period of the meeting by staff following the two-minute speaking limit and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. Also, for the meeting notice, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. This meeting, I received one submitted comment in writing from Virginia Cowles. A note, this letter was submitted by Ms. Cowles to Mr. Carlos Brown at the Richmond District CTB, which is the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Ms. Cowles asked this to be read at the board meeting. Dear Mr. Brown, please support keeping sidewalk projects in the final version of the 2022 to 2027 six year improvement plan. Specifically, any projects that would provide safe and interconnected access for bus riders, especially those with disabilities. District-wide sidewalk projects such as UPC 110833 and pedestrian safety projects along GRTC routes, such as UPC 113998 and 115888, would be most helpful to those who rely on public transit for transportation to jobs, post-secondary education, groceries, or health care. Even smaller projects, such as those along West Broad Street, UPC 11106, 115417, 118470, US Route 1, UPC 111712, 115415, Laburnum Avenue, UPC 109190, 115411, 117034, 117042, and bear with me, we're almost through the numbers, 117053, Nine Mile Road, UPC T25029, T25106, Williamsburg Road, UPC T25027, and Midlothian Turnpike, UPC 115063 would improve daily life for residents dependent on bus service as they navigate the transit system. Your support for these projects will be greatly appreciated. Sincerely yours, Virginia Cal, the chair of the Transportation Committee and League of Women Voters, RMA, and also included were two photos previously shared by our CEO, Julie Tim, during the ice storm in February of uh, the conditions at some of the bus stops on South Side and on some of these roads that were specifically mentioned. And Mr. Chair, this concludes the public comment. Thank you. Uh, she has been a, and the League of Women Voters have been consistent advocates for effective public transportation in Metro Richmond. And this is about um, looking at the 35% of the CVTA money, um, correct, Julie? Um, uh, it went to Carlos. So I'm thinking they're looking for support for pads and sidewalks at um, at bus stops. Well, I, I suspect that we're, um, and we just had an article that came out yesterday because of the Bond Score project. So this is a very timely comment. I believe that they're, we're looking for support across the industry, both with, at the TPO, their CMAC funds and STBG funds that are controlled, um, that are federal funds controlled by the TPO. There are the 35% CVTA funds that could also be uh, used in this way, prioritized. And then our own federal funds and our own grants that we go after could possibly be used. So we have a wide range. And so understanding that there is a, a wide support and need for this is good to hear. And, and we coordinate with the um, 
with our various jurisdiction localities um, on these on these pad issues? Yes, sir. Uh, primarily, we we coordinate uh, directly with either a combination of the local jurisdictions with VDOT uh, or with private entities, depending on who owns the actual right of way where the stops and the pads are. We do not own any of that right of way, so we have to get proper permissions, easements, and permits to put out any pads, uh, seating, shelters, or connected sidewalks. There, it's not our property, so therefore we have to have the proper permits. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's, um, uh, everybody seeing the minutes? Uh, can I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the minutes of the April meeting be approved. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That's it, thank you, it's Pat. They've been approved and we will move now um, to a description of uh, the development <clears throat> engagement report from um, Adrian Torres, our Chief Development Officer. Ms. Torres. Adrian, are you around? Yes, sorry, I was on mute. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Share my screen with you guys. All right. Try one more time. All right, are you able to see my Word document with the just the outline? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so what's been happening since our last board meeting um, related to CBTA, we had the full authority meeting. The last one was on April 30th. Um, they talked about the FY22 revenue projections and the part that was fairly relevant to GRTC um, for the 15% for transit. Uh, we are looking at an estimate of about 28.1 million for FY22. Um, they also approved the draft MOA um, with GRTC. Uh, and the current status of this is that it was signed by uh, Julie, our CEO, uh, for board approval, and is currently with Henrico to get the CBTA board chair signature on it. Um, at our last TAC meeting, uh, we always cover quite a bit. The last one was on May 10th. Uh, we went over the update for the Regional Public Transportation Plan, um, the draft version. I have a presentation on that later, so I'm not going to get into the updates right now. Um, transit governance report that continues. We have subcommittee meetings every other week. So the last one was on May 7th. What they've completed so far was their phase one, which is the strategic assessments, the GRTC, peer studies, and benchmarking, as well as they've completed all their interviews. Um, various entities, they did GRTC, um, all the jurisdictions, GRPT, legislatures, as well as CTB. Um, the next two phases are in progress. So They've done a presentation and research on what is a transportation district, how it's relevant to um, Virginia, and uh, specifically to the region. And um, they are following up with DRPT on that and a little bit more. Um, there is a lot more details to kind of work out. So that's kind of the current state of that right now. Um, phase three is the governance strategy, so evaluation of GRTC compared to all the peers that they've looked at. Um, they did private presentation to all the peers. And then the next step would be um, reporting on the draft and final report. Our next that report goes that to the that report goes to the governor. Um, it does. Right. It does. Mm -hmm. uh, our next meeting for that is May 21st. Um, also covered um, in TAC is the regional project prioritization. That's the 35% we were just referring to. Um, and then we also discussed uh, the certification reporting and the voting rule. Uh, the last finance committee meeting was just a few days ago on May 12th. Um, just some highlights. Uh, they were just updating that the CBTA full authority did approve the GRTC uh, draft MOA, um, covered FY22 revenue projections again, um, and they recommended for approval the FY22 operating budget. As far as future meeting dates, um, the next finance meeting is June 9th, the TAC is June 14th, and um, the May full authority is on the 28th. Question. This um, constant meetings of committees. <laughs> That's a good summary of it, yes. <laughs> All right. Is that it for you? 
That's it. That's it for now. All right. More to come later. <laughs> okay. So now we have uh, bus advertising renewal. Um, nobody had any questions on the CVTA, right? Bus advertising renewal, uh, Carrie. Uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, before Carrie begins, if I could uh, make sure that Mr. Smith is recognized for attendance. Oh, good. Danny, you here? Yes. He, Can he, you hear me, Danny? He, Mr. Smith. He might be still working on his audio. I'm in. Are you here? I'm here. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Thank you. Lost the link here, but I'm back. <laughs> Ms. Rose Pays. Thank you, Mr. Chair. GRTC currently contracts for advertising sales with Media Transit Inc. as approved by the Board of Directors on May 19th of 2020. This agreement is structured as a one-year contract with options for GRTC to renew for four additional periods of one year each at the same fee. GRTC would like to renew for one year at the previous terms, but with language added to properly compensate media transit staff when they perform quality control on the fleet at GRTC's request. For example, when we need help with channel card inventory and old channel card removals. In year one, media transit exceeded their minimum guaranteed revenue. Uh, they brought in $323,761.50 gross revenue, which netted us at GRTC $229,870.67. As a reminder, media transit's commission is at the rate of 29% of the gross revenue, which means they earned $93,890.84 through March, which was the most recent report as of this submission. Although revenue expectations were exceeded, GRTC's goals for maintaining at least 60% of available ad space sold were not met in year one. This is not a contractual requirement, but serves as a goal to maximize ad placement and spur revenue generation. Media Transit's most recent reports showed only 38% to 42% of total space sold, which is down from last fall when Media Transit had 54% to 62% of spaces sold. In year two, guaranteed minimum revenue is expected to be at least $180,000 for GRTC, so that's what we would take home. Based on year one performance, GRTC reasonably expects Media Transit to meet and exceed this amount. GRTC staff, we plan to use the available rear space in 2021 and 2022 to place now hiring advertisements and possibly some safety mes messaging on the rears and explore possible art partnerships for the available side spaces. The recommendation is that the Board of Directors authorizes the CEO to execute another one-year agreement for advertising sales services with Media Transit for the same 29% of annual gross receipts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Moved. Any, uh, Julie or, or Carrie, either of you have anything to say about this? Um, do we have to pay them 29% when we put our own sign on it? No, sir. Okay. And the sign on the back is gonna say, don't drive into the back of this bus. Uh, that is part of the safety messaging, yes, that we are looking into All right. in addition to now. Is there a second to the approval of this? Second. Uh, it's moved and seconded that we approve this advertising renewal. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, it's been approved. Now, thank you very thank you, much. Mm -hmm. Now we'll go to the uh, operations and maintenance report. Cheryl, Ms. Adams. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so operations and maintenance report will be given by staff as listed on the agenda. First up is Mr. Tim Barham, who will give us our operating performance. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, and good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Starting with the KPIs, uh, which are starting on page uh, 21 of your board packet, uh, On-time performance, still around 66%. Uh, unfortunately, we had some uh, additional um, detours that took place this past month around uh, the downtown area, in particular, that affected several of our routes, you know, with new buildings and parking decks and structures and so forth. Um, you know, that uh, had an impact on our own time for the month. 
so we are continuing with our initiatives that we talked about last month. Uh, one other thing that we did put in place is uh, we've trained uh, some of our admin staff uh, to help in the radio room. Uh, what they're doing is uh, they're looking through Clever, uh, checking on routes that are running uh, late or early, uh, and proactively working with the radio dispatchers to get that feedback to the uh, operators so that we can make those adjustments so, uh, so that we can uh, hopefully uh, continue to put that into a positive direction. Uh, we also you know, continue to solicit feedback from the operators on any of those routes that have running time issues. Uh, the scheduling department has been working on adjustments on certain routes uh, to go into effect for the June 20th booking. Uh, and speaking of the June 20th booking, uh, we've been working with the union uh, to make sure that all of the uh, contractual changes uh, go into effect, uh, which uh, were agreed upon to start with June 20th. Uh, like the 20 minute meal breaks and so forth, uh, which, which will take part during the uh, upcoming booking. Uh, specialized transportation uh, care uh, on time performance still around 93%, so hold it steady there. Tism has gone up, uh, it did go up this past month around 17%. Uh, several factors with that uh, causing that to go up. You know, we had uh, our number of vacations this past month with springtime, you know, Easter spring break and so forth. So uh, a lot of scheduled vacation time uh, took place this past month. Uh, also, uh, we did have some positive COVID cases uh, that resulted in contact tracing. So we have to go through those scenarios as well. Uh, and for those individuals that have been taking the vaccine uh, that may have had some reactions to the second dose, uh, you know, those individuals were taken off as well uh, to recover uh, from that. So, so those factors, uh, we believe, is what contributed to the, uh, to the increase uh, in that. Uh, with recruitment and manpower efforts, uh, we are currently at 264 full-time and 19 part-time operators. Uh, we have a class of three trainees uh, that are scheduled to graduate uh, the end of the month. Uh, we also con conducted a round of interviews uh, for our next class. Uh, we have a class of six uh, that will be starting on June the 7th. Uh, continuing with our efforts, you know, with you know, Facebook jobs, for example, uh, you know, targeting college uh, students and so forth. Uh, and we're looking at whatever outside the box uh, initiatives that we can do uh, to improve on those efforts, uh, looking at other initiatives and, and alternatives and so forth, uh, you know, soliciting assistance from local businesses. We, we, we even had a recruitment uh, event uh, at a local barbershop uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, trying to uh, get folks interested in coming to GRTC. Uh, and we also uh, have a meeting scheduled, a uh, virtual meeting uh, next month uh, with BTA. You know, they've invited uh, agencies from around the Commonwealth uh, to meet to look at best practices and ways in which we can uh, improve on recruitment. Because uh, as we've said previously, this is an industry-wide issue uh, when it comes to getting good qualified uh, CDL operators or folks who uh, who want to obtain their CDL and we can train them towards that. Uh, so we'll be meeting with them to uh, hopefully get some I other ideas uh, in which we can improve our recruitment efforts. Uh, going into COVID-19, uh, we've been still encouraging our employees uh, to take the vaccine. Uh, as of yesterday, we had 206 employees that were fully vaccinated. You know, that's about 44% uh, of all of our employees, uh, plus an additional 17 uh, that reported to have taken at least uh, one dose. Uh, so we're encouraged about that as people continue to go through and, uh, and, and get both shots. Uh, we, had, we still have one outstanding positive COVID case. Uh, and you know, as I mentioned earlier with the uh, vaccine and, and the folks that are taking those second doses, you know, we are paying that additional sick day if they need it uh, up through uh, the end of June. Uh, as afforded to us through the uh, CARES Act funding. And unless there is any other questions or questions, uh, that concludes my report. Any questions? Thanks, Mr. Barham. Thank you. Mr. Ross. Good morning. Good morning. I am going to be um, sharing a report with you. So let me pull that up. Hopefully you can all see that Excel spreadsheet. 
So I'll be going over a report that will, um, it's a bit of a refresh on a report that you're all very familiar with. Um, so per Julie's request, uh, the planning department has reworked uh, what we formerly called the FITS report, um, which you were all very familiar with receiving every month um, that reported on monthly ridership. Um, so what we've done is actually rework the report to kind of show um, a bit broader trends. Um, what we noticed is that in light of COVID, the FITS report really wasn't telling a very comprehensive story um, as far as what our ridership was doing. Um, so we've gone in and I'll kind of just give you a very quick high level walkthrough of the format of the new report so you're familiar with, uh, with it as you receive it in subsequent months, um, but it should all look very familiar uh, to you. Um, we've just gone in and kind of added some more um, data sets so that you have uh, kind of a larger context to look at ridership in. So as you can see, um, the first column is the month that we're reporting on. So for this month, we're looking at April ridership. Um, we added the month previous ridership. So you can kind of just see there how we're doing as, as compared to March. And then we've gone in and added um, April 2020, um, which is of course during COVID and then um, two years prior, so 2019, um, to give you an idea of kind of how we're looking pre-COVID numbers. Um, and our new data analyst, uh, Elizabeth, reworked this report. She added a lot of graphs for us as well. So just to give you kind of some visuals on how our ridership is doing. Um, you'll see it has the same breakdown that we used in the fifth as far as um, fixed route and specialized. We've just gone in and added some information about the jurisdictional breakdown. So you can see that detail as well. Um, and scrolling down, uh, you still have the fiscal year to date information. Um, we have the same breakdown. So in comparison to 2020 versus 2019. Um, Van Pool, you can still find on here um, and the fixed route and specialized breakdowns as well. Um, so after giving you that kind of very high level tour, um, I'll just kind of show you the April ridership. Um, so just looking big picture um, in April, we're at about 640,941 riders. Um, as compared to March, we are down very slightly. Um, and this is probably all attributed to um, what Tim just reviewed. Um, so the month itself had one less weekday um, than we did in March. Of course, weekdays are our highest ridership. Um, there was also a holiday in there, um, like Tim said, that could have attributed for, for some of that. Um, and we also had higher missed trips um, in the month of April. So you'll see that very small um, decrease. However, if we're comparing to 2020, we are of course um, doing much better than we were at the start of the pandemic. Um, and comparing to 2019, we still have a lot of room to grow to get back uh, to those numbers, but we are on trend, as you can see, um, moving towards those pre-COVID numbers. Um, kind of the same, similar trends with uh, care ridership. And we're also including, um, this I believe is in your board packet as well, um, some more breakdowns as far as um, broken down by jurisdiction. Um, so if you're interested in looking at that information, that should be there for you as well. Unfortunately, those did not seem to make it in the board packet, but we can make them available to all board members okay. and to the public. Thank you. Uh, any questions of this? That's very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much. I think we're next to uh, Mr. Bird. Maintenance performance. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is the maintenance report. The ongoing delays in parts and the periodic slowdown of maintenance repairs in-house due to COVID quarantine of maintenance staff has impacted GRTC's ability to maintain enough vehicles for service. Currently, we have 10% of the fixed route fleet and 18% of the parish resident fleet out for service and or parts. This is, this is down from a peak number of vehicles out for service in early May of 18% and 23% respectively. Delivery of fleet parts from GRTC, Cummins, for GRTC from Gillick, Cummins, and other manufacturers have been fluctuating due to the unreliable availability of raw materials. GRTC has weekly reached out to all known sources for backup parts and supplies, and through this effort have been able to maintain service. GRTC 
has completed AC checks on 100% of the fleet and prepared for the summer service. GRTC continues to clean and disinfect the entire fleet daily. This ends the maintenance report. If I can jump in, uh, Tony, thank you so much for that. Just to, to clarify that when he, um, Tony was mentioning that the maintenance of parts and the, the ability of us to maintain service because of the um, because of the, the shortage of parts nationwide, Tony has done an exceptional job to make sure that we have not to date been impacted by this. We've come close, but our spare fleet ratio is 20%. So when he says that 10% are in, in the shop, that's down from earlier this month where it was 18%. Where, <coughs> where there was some concern that a lack of the, those parts nationwide could impact service. Tony and his team have been on it. They've gotten the parts in, and so I just want to give a little bit of credit there. It's not like we're not making pull out. We want to make you aware that this is an issue, and we're tracking it, and it's doing a good job. But as the shortages continue nationwide, this could impact us for future pullouts. But as of today, we've not been able, we've not lost service because of shortage of parts, um, right, Tony? That's correct. Right. All right. Any further questions? I'm glad that air conditioning is ready to to hum. Um, thank you very much for that report, um, Mr. Carter. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll be going over the safety performance report for the month of April. That's found on pages 34 through 36 of the board packet. Starting with the results for the month. External accidents. In the month of April, we had 35, which is down from the month of March, which we had 46. Non-preventable accidents. We had 32 in the month of March, and in April we had 21. We did see a decline in the amount of type or the type of accidents in which the bus was rear-ended. Mr. Campbell, you made a comment about that earlier, so that's some good news there. Um, in the last meeting, I also reported out that we were going to be talking with um, the safety department. We get with the maintenance department. We come up with some ideas on how to make the back of the bus a little bit more visible. Um, Tony Bird and I did meet with a local representative from a company that's going to work on building a sign, sort of a stop sign that's illuminated um, to go on the back of the bus. Um, currently, they're building a prototype, and we're going to put it on a couple of the buses just to see how it looks so far as from an operational standpoint. It's also a couple of inspections that it has to go to to make sure that it is properly functioning well. So that's something that we're working on. Um, Overall, we did see a decrease in the uh, numbers so far as the accidents. One thing we did notice, we did increase in pre uh, preventable type accidents on the traffic side of accidents. And that's something that we're gonna to continue to work on to bring that down. We noticed that we're having a little bit more fixed uh, object accidents and things of that nature. Um, reminding operators of the foliage in the upcoming months, the growing out of the limbs and that type of thing, and also getting with Department of Public Utilities when we're pinpointing those type of spots to have them trim back trees and trim back limbs and that type of thing to make it a little bit more easier for the operators to pull into certain stops. Um, if you notice on the report, we did have one pedestrian type accidents um, to give you a high, a real high overview of what happened with that uh, passenger or a person was actually crossing the street trip and fell into the side of the bus and made contact with the bus. So that classified as a pedestrian type accident. Um, we continue to get good feedback from when the operators come into the training department and go over certain type of accidents and they get feedback from the training staff. Um, we have new training videos on deck for the operators. We're gonna give them a little bit more time to complete the current video visual uh, trainings that we have in place now. Um, and also, the new videos are more geared towards the actual operator that we're really using our training, our visual training platform so that they don't have to come into the office. They can log on wherever they are to actually do the training videos. And we're getting a good, lot of good feedback from those videos as well. Um, we continue with the safety blitzes. Supervisors and the training staff are constantly monitoring the operation side of things so far as how the operators are operating the bus in the safest manner, as well as interaction with the um, customers to make sure that everybody is safe as possible and doing everything they possibly can to remain as safe as possible. And if there are no questions, that concludes the actual safety performance report for the month of April. 
Thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, keep up the good work. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. Mr. Chair, I have a quick yes. question. I'm mm -hmm. not sure who needs to answer this, um, but I noticed on the fixed root complaints, there's been a high number of valid complaints over the past couple of months. I'm just kind of curious if that has to do with droop, dropped routes or on time or, or what is that? Yeah, so a lot of that has to do with the missed trips when uh, a bus doesn't show. Uh, previously, we would do uh, we would classify those as questionable, but they are actually valid complaints if a bus doesn't show. So Absolutely. That's why the number of valid complaints was up this month. We started reclassifying those a different way. Thank you. Yeah, so we we may have had high number of those complaints before. We just didn't classify them this way. That is okay. Correct. Yeah, Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Campbell, I have asked the team to internally look at our, the way we review it and we classify the complaints. Um, I, I want to be able to track trends better. So we are doing an internal assessment about how they're classified, how we track them, and how we, we improve on that. So you will see some changes there. I apologize for not giving you a heads up on that. Yeah, I think the, um, one of the worst things that happens for us is a no-show of a bus. Yeah. That's uh, that's when we really have failed, and we have, yeah. to, have to stay after that. Thanks for asking that, Gary. Um, that's good catch. Yeah. Okay. Any anything further on this? Thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I think we're going to lease some tires, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> the in the board action item can be found on page thirty-seven of your board packet. GRTC currently has an agreement with Michelin North America for tire services. The agreement consists of a three-year base term with two one-year options to renew. The base term will expire on May 31st, 2021. And what this lease provides is installation and maintenance for all of our rolling stock. Uh, that includes fixed route in specialized transportation vehicles. The agreement consists of a variable rate per tire type based on actual miles driven and a fixed rate for the installation and maintenance service provided by Michelin subcontractor, which is Big Apple Tire. Big Apple Tire is certified by, the, by Virginia's Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity they are both a DBE and SWAM vendor. Staff's estimate for option year one, the cost, we, we estimate the cost to be approximately $501,060. And option year two, we estimated that cost to be approximately $526,211. These costs are fully funded from the operating budget. Staff is pleased with Michelin and Big Apple Tire's performance, and we recommend that the Board of Directors authorizes the CEO to exercise option year one for the period of June 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2022. If Michelin service continues to be satisfactory, we recommend that you give the CEO the discretion to exercise option year two for tirely services through May 2023. Thank you. Uh, could I have a motion to that effect? No. Mm -hmm. All right. So a second. Second. Okay. So we're basically authorizing two years based upon um, upon the CEO's evaluation of the first year. That's correct. Any further conversation on this? Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Thank you very much, Ms. Thompson. Mr. Campbell, if I might make a, a, a slight comment, uh, you'll see some ongoing changes to different ways that we're address, uh, approaching some of these contracts. In the past, every option year um, has come before the board. Sometimes we'll have five-year contracts, but it's a one-year contract before a one-year option, which means we have to come back to the board every year. When a performance is doing well, we'd like to shift that, and, and you'll see that reflected in these where you're giving us authorization for the entire term of the contract based on performance rather than having us to come back and keep asking for permission to renew those option years. So this is one of those changes where we're trying to make the board meetings a little bit more efficient. 
Well, uh, Ms. Tim, the, the issue on this, though, I will say, um, as a person who's only been on this board for, uh, you know, a short time, is that this is how I learn about the operation. And, um, and God knows what your board is going to be over the next five years. I mean, who's going to be on it? There will be new people for sure. Um, so I think there's actually, when you're talking about a contract for $500,000, it's, it is not harmful for that to come up for people to see it. And so I would encourage you to be aware of that. This is, this is how one learns. I would have no clue that we rent tires. Um, I think and, uh, I, I love that, that conversation. Maybe what we could add is a, a part where we have the upcoming procurement. We also have a discussion about the procurement renewal. Might be, yeah. Just, it's just a, a, an informational piece. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Virginia Risk Sharing Association Insurance Policy Renewal, Mr. Carter. Yes, sir, good morning again. Good morning. It's that time of year again when we're starting looking at insurance re renewals. Um, this is Virginia Risk Sharing Association Insurance Policy Renewal. Just to give you a little background, GRTC currently has insurance coverage with Virginia Risk Sharing Association, VERSA, for property, boiler, and machinery equipment breakdown and workers' compensation. VERSA is a group self-insured pool in the Commonwealth of Virginia that provides claims service to 480 Virginia local political subdivisions. VERSA is governed by a member supervisory board comprised of eight elected or appointed officials from member jurisdictions and the executive director of the Virginia Municipal League. Now the proposal that, Virginia, that VERSA gave to GRTC for this upcoming insurance policy is about a $2,600 increase over last year's premium. This is a tribute to the reinsurance and excess coverage market hardening for both property and liability insurance, which has a direct impact on all insurance markets, including workers' compensation. With these markets hardening, this causes a rise in rates and narrowing, narrowing coverage terms. Public entities are under scrutiny in both areas from factors such as COVID-19, weather-related property losses, complex litigation, and cybersecurity. Although we've seen an increase in premium overall, the increase is not as high as it could have been. We did have an increase in workers' compensation claims, which is trending upward industry-wide. However, the number of GRTC claims that were compensable were low. And what I did, if you look at the report, you can see that there's a coverage breakdown and the limits and the actual premium and how that breaks down. Of course, workers' compensation is driving the cost of this. And um, also, you'll see a definition of coverage and how that is applicable to GRTC if we were to file a claim under this actual policy. The recommendation is that the board of directors approve the CEO to enter into a policy contract with VERSA to renew these policies based on VERSA's proposal of $449,126. Are there any questions? So this is an insurance pool, a kind of a pool thing that we do? Yes, sir. All right, any, uh, could I have a motion to approve this? So moved. Second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, approve the renewal of the Versa um, insurance policy. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It's been passed. Thank you very much, Mr. Zinzarella. And thank you, um, Tony. Thank uh, you. Mr. Zinzarella, we're ready for you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. A lot of the, the, a lot of the uh, financial report variance items or so forth are very consistent with the last several months that we've been talking about. So um, looking on slide 41 for the slide for the source of funds, uh, you see, you know, for year to date through March, the nine months of unfavorable variance of 1.67 million, the same actors uh, that we have talked about in the previous months, directly generated revenue is favorable 246. That's based upon um, advertising revenue down in this line and up here for the uh, passenger uh, uh, fares, which is from the VCU program. Um, the local government funds are slightly unfavorable at 179,000. As we talked about, that's based upon um, the billing for some of the so for some of the local governments is based upon the actual expenditures less what's received from the state and the Fed, and because we're running extremely 
favorable in expenses, therefore the revenue side is unfavorable. Uh, the state of, state is favorable, uh, continuing to grow favorably at 1.4 million, and that's based upon uh, the you know when the budget was contemplated, it didn't uh, t didn't uh, take into account full the full uh, grant from the state. What uh, what piece of paper are you looking at? Mr. We're on uh, we're on slide 41. Thank you. And John, the, are you are you trying to share your screen? Oh, thank you. We had a malfunction. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's better now. Uh, no, we're we're still not seeing it, John. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Off to there the races. Go. All right. Sorry. Uh, so on the federal funds, as we talked in the prior months, uh, we're, we're favorable in the operating expense about 3.6 million. Therefore it was less expenses to seek reimbursement for. Uh, so not much different than in the prior month's reports as to what is driving the performance of actual versus budget on the source of funds. So we're, we're working here on the first quarter, not on, um, well, this is, well, this is the, this is year to date. So this will be nine months. So yeah. As a reminder, our fiscal year runs uh, from July 1st through June 30th. So this we are in the, this is the, uh, the ending of the third quarter here. Uh, on slide 42 is just a little, you know, condensed format uh, at the source of funds, looking at it in a bar chart, as well as it's basically the same theme of the variances that I just shared. Um, the operating, we're going to ignore this slide. This is slide 43. This is the optic chart. What we've done is you'll see in the board package, I've broken it up. Uh, so the, as you can see the layout, this is the vehicle operations. The vehicle operations, you can see that on two pages on slide 44 and 45. The vehicle maintenance is broken up on page slides 46 and 47. Um, facility maintenance is on 50 and 51. And the DNA portion uh, is on it's 50 and 51, excuse me, the uh, facility maintenance is on 48 and 49, and then the total GRTC is broken up on slides 52 and 53. So um, going, I'm gonna jump to, sorry, looking at it in total, which would be slides 52 and 53, very similar uh, discussions in the prior, as we've had in the prior months on operating expenses. So this would be slide 52 right here. So looking at our, our operating expenses, still uh, labor variances are 1.35 million. Uh, the majority of that is in the vehicle operations, which we'd see on slide 44, 673, uh, of which $149,000 is in the operator salaries. That would be also invisible on slide 44. And uh, the portion of the vehicle operations for the other non-revenue vehicles was 254 and the balance, uh, 254,000 and the balance of the favorable for the vehicle operations would be in the fringe benefits. So this here is the summary. So you can see that the majority of the labor variance is caught up in fringe benefits. That's basically due to the head count. Um, as, you, as you have, as I reported in the prior months, uh, the vehicle operations are 15 positions uh, vacant on a budget of 323 personnel and in the maintenance facility, uh, their, the maintenance uh, uh, headcount is nine positions favorable versus a budget of 78. So that's primarily driving the, the variance here on, on, the, uh, on the operator uh, salaries and wages for, for the operators and down here for the non-revenue uh, non vehicles. And then you'll see that both the maintenance, the operations and GNA are contributing to the favorable fringe benefits. Going down to slide 53, you'll see the other components that we've, we've talked about in the prior months as well. The services line, I'm sorry, the services line, I apologize, was on 52, is 1.3 million favorable. And that was being driven uh, by the professional technical services, which is you know favorable uh, versus budget for uh, BRT fair collection security services as, as we are fair or zero fair at the time. We don't have to incur those expenses. Also slightly favorable due to the timing of the audit fees. Um, the planning and scheduling consulting is favorable by about $38,000. It's also uh, based upon need or timing and slightly favorable in advertising and promotion expenses. The, uh, 
materials and services on slide 53 is unfavorable 1,018,000, 1, and that's based upon basically the incremental expenses associated with the you know, with COVID. It's the 1.4 million, so that's the same same discussion points that we've had in prior months. And down on the uh, the uh, purchase transportation is extremely favorable at 1.966, which is basically you know reduced demand because of COVID for both Spectran and the van pool. So um, I'm gonna, very, very similar themes to the prior months. So I'm gonna move on to um, the next slide, which would, uh, which basically shows the, the tables for the operating expenses for the months and breaks it down in summary formats. The call outs uh, year to date for the through nine months through the end of March, uh, actual revenue miles were 4.1 million miles. So when you apply that against the actual excuse me, the actual expenditures, we're averaging about nine, $9.74, uh, $9.74 a revenue mile. And we've had about 372,000 revenue hours. So therefore about $108.19 per revenue hour. You know, some tabular uh, bar charts and then the narratives. But coming down here, as you can see, um, when we talk about the operating expense per mile, uh, the labor components, about 66% of our total costs. Um, and as you can see down here uh, in the headcount, um, you know, the, the, the favorableness is driving the, the, uh, the operating variances. Okay. Moving over to the uh, statement of income, which was is slide 57 in your package. Very similar to what we talked about on the sources of funds. You'll see here on the operating revenue, it's favorable $375,000. And that's based upon the advertising revenue and the passenger pass uh, program from VCU. The other income is unfavorable. That's due to um, the unfavorable interest income primarily uh, due to lower uh, cash balances in the beginning of the year, plus a more aggressive uh, budgetary assumption on interest return. The operating contributions, 1.95 million unfavorable, um, primarily from the federal, as we talked about, the operating expenses being favorable to budget, less to reimburse. As you can see down here, the operating expenses are um, favorable, 3.6 million. Uh, so that's very similar to what we talked about in the, in the prior months. Going on to slide 58, which is the balance sheet, you'll, you'll continue to see um, Increasing strengthening of the cash position up to $8 million, uh, up from uh, prior year end at 1.5 million, um, up from the prior month's 6.4 million. Uh, accounts receivable, you know, pretty pretty consistent with prior month. Items to call out and to your attention on the balance sheet um, down here in the other assets. Um, we did receive, and I'll show you the detail in a couple of slides, we did receive um, money from the CVTA during the month of March, and we did have some expenditures, but they're the net of the increase in, in, in the cash positions relative to um, the, the, uh, the, the CVTA is down here. Uh, otherwise, the balance sheet is remaining strong. Moving on to slide 59, the cash flow projections. Uh, the month, the month of March actual, it, it increased uh, cash 1.65 million as we had discussed um, in the prior month. And in the, during the month of March was the receipt of the Richmond's quarterly uh, operating contribution in $2,075,000, which basically wrote it up. And then as you can see, um, our projections for the next couple of months, it's, it's a leveling down to around this range. Uh, I also call out it during the month of April You'll see the payroll number slightly higher just because the way the month of April hits, there's more payroll days that hit in that month. Uh, so the cash flow is 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 uh, there's basically two and a half to three three payrolls there in the month of April. Therefore, the spike um, on the cash flow. Um, moving on to as I discussed previously, um, the the CBTA. Um, as part of the memo of, of agreement, GRTC has to file a quarterly report for each quarter ending. So it was due on May 15th. So we this is the report that we filed. And basically what it shows is obviously at the beginning of the, this year, this is a calendar year uh, look. So there was no balance. And then during the month of March, we received two 
transferred. So the first transfer was for the $200,000, which was specifically for funds for the regional public transportation plan preparation. And then we got the balance, uh, the balance of the, of the, of the inflow was the 15% distribution through the month of February 28th. That would be um, through the receipts by the local jurisdictions through January. So the total of the inflows was 9.8 million. And during you know year to date, uh, we incurred $70,532.82 to date with Michael Baker International for assisting us in the regional public transportation plan, leaving us a balance of $9.758 million at the end of March. Um, those are the highlights for the uh, the operating uh, report, uh, financial operating report for the month of March. If there are any questions, uh, I'll take them now. Thank you, Mr. Zinzarella. Are there questions about this report? Okay. Well, thanks for that um, comprehensive work. Um, so now we go to procurements, uh, Ms. Thompson. Yes, sir. Hello again. Hello. Um, our, the procurements report can be found on pages 61 and 62 of your board packet. There was one purchase between 50,000 and 250,000, which required the board chair's approval. And this has to do with the city of Richmond's signal system phase three project. The completion of this project will allow seven of GRTC's pulse BRT stations to shift from leased communications over to the city's fiber optic network. This will improve reliability and reduce monthly operational costs for us. Um, so GRTC is allocating a not to exceed amount of $67,166 from its operating budget to go towards this project. I also have three new upcoming procurements to share with you. The first two are requests from the marketing department and they are to establish on-call contracts for graphic design and video production services. We have a budget of 18,500 set for the video production. Um, and this has been included in the draft, draft FY22 budget. And funding needs for the graphic design services project will be determined as we begin planning that procurement. Lastly, we will be working on a renewal for ADA paratransit client certification services, and this is for the transportation department. Basically, what the service provides is a determination of eligibility um, for customers who would like to use specialized transportation services. The budget for this service for the next two years is $125,000. And it is my intent to bring that to the board next month. Thank you. If there are no questions, that concludes my report. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Taggart, I think you're up now. Good morning. Good morning. One moment, please. Can everyone see the the, the, the screen share? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, back in November of 20, 2020, the board approved the award of a contract with Plant Moran to perform a uh, current state assessment of GRTC's processes and systems in relation to enterprise resource planning or ERP for short. Uh, that was a multi-phase project and their first step of that uh, project was to perform this assessment of our current systems, our current business processes, which concluded, and I'm now here to update the board on the results of that assessment, as well as what our next steps are. So their findings um, found many things that we were already aware of. One of the most uh, interesting things that was found was our current accounting system, Great Plains, in its state that we use today is, is going to end of life within the next 12 to 18 months. The uh, Microsoft will be end of life in this system. And what that basically means is they will no longer be creating updates or security fixes for the software and they will be retiring it. They're replacing it with their cloud-based ERP system. Um, so it's a totally completely separate system from what we have today. 
Um, the other th many things that were found was there's many manual spreadsheets throughout the organization to track data. We, a lot of our processes require multiple manual entries by the same person into multiple systems, which is prone to leading to er er um, errors. Um, these inefficient processes potentially will lead to us requiring to overstaff in areas to ease the workload for our team members. Um, it makes the reconciliation process very difficult to, with reconciliation having, having to happen multiple times. It's extremely hard for our leadership to pull and see KPIs and other metrics around the organization. It could lead to a potential increase in findings during audits. And most importantly, it leads to frustration for our great team here because of the, the manual processes. And on the right there, just to call out a few comments that were gathered from staff during this assessment process. So this slide here gives you a, an overview um, of each department and the uh, blue squares show you where we are today um, and then obviously where we would like to get to. And basically these are a, a rating system that is used when they do these evaluations to kind of rate your processes and where you sit. And we would like to get to integrated, which would be a fully flushed out, efficient process utilizing technology and software systems to you know, ensure that data is, is stored in one location and the processes flow smoothly. So you can kind of see down through this, this is also in your board packet, so you can go back and review this as well, um, where we are today and where we would like to get to. We would like to get to integrated. I would like to make a quick comment about the optimized column. So integrated is, is a fully uh, automated system and efficient system for all of these departments. And what optimize is, is optimize is where you would get to in a phase two, where you're taking it to that next step where you're integrating things like EAM, which is enterprise asset management or managing all of our assets on the, on the fleet and maintenance and integrating with other systems where you take it to that next level. So we're taking the approach of the crawl, walk, run. And so right now we're crawling. We wanna to get to walking, which is integrated and then eventually optimized, which is running. So quickly, what is an ERP system or enterprise resource planning system? This graphic here kind of lays out the, the stages that we would like to get to. And if you look in the middle of the graphic, you'll see core ERP. And what that is, is an enterprise resource planning system is a centralized system where all of your data is stored in one place. So when you in, input invoice data or procurement data or payroll data, all of that is in a central repository, which makes it easy for you to report out on the information. It requires one entry of the data and can be used by multiple systems. And it makes all of the various departments connect and work well together. So in our first step would be the core ERP, which would be financial, HR, and payroll. From there, back to that optimized I was discussing, we would like to get to optimize, which would link in the enterprise asset management, which is basically our fleet maintenance system for the maintenance of our fleet and all of our assets, as well as electronic document management and linking those systems together in a future phase or in tandem would then bring us to that optimized stage. And then farther out from there, would be linking up with our external vendors, having vendors actually link with our system electronically and, and reducing the amount of manual paper processes that we have. So what could a future state look like? This slide here is just a, a, an example for you of what a future state would look like where we're in that optimized stage. And so this graphic shows you our ERP system in the center and then it shows you our enterprise asset management system off to the left. And then obviously Hastas feeding us to the right, but it shows you how information could flow and where that information would come from and how it would flow through the system. These are some of the outcomes that we would like to see from doing this project. So we wanna improve efficiency, eliminate many of those paper-based processes, those manual processes, having to enter data twice, uh, you know, multiple times. We wanna increase our decision-making abilities, making it easier for um, all of our team members as well as our executives to be able to make decisions based on that data, as well as managing our processes, reducing costs, you know, reducing that stress level or the amount of work that our, that our team members are having to do for all of their processes and, and making it more efficient. And that also allows us to right size on our staff size as well. So with all of that being said, what's this going to cost? So this slide here, these are not exact costs. 
um, we are at the, the point of estimating costs. So the, these numbers came from the uh, consultant plant Moran's analysis doing our independent cost estimate that's required for our procurement guidelines. But this gives you an idea of the range of what the, these solutions will cost. And so walking quickly through the slide, uh, the top area you have your, your low and your high. And basically, kind of like when we went through the procurement in November for Plant Moran, when we put that RFP out on the street, we had a huge range of responses, very low to incredibly high. And we ended up somewhere in the middle. And I anticipate us doing somewhere something similar here without knowing what, what kind of companies or what kind of software is going to respond to our RFP, we want to give you that range. And so basically all we're doing here is we're outlining what those costs look could potentially look like. You'll notice though that the implementation assistance piece is the same on every line at 367,000. That is the cost for Plant Moran to do phase two, which we already approved in November. That's their piece where they're going to be our advocate and assistant down through it. I want to highlight that the cost at the very bottom, years one and two is combined. And that is where we're gonna be going after federal and state grant funding for those costs for fiscal year 23. That's for implementing the system and those first two years of the expense of the system. Almost all of the systems now have moved to a cloud-based software as a service model. So whatever solution we, we land on, that, that will be an annual cost. So we're gonna know every year what that system's going to cost us without us having to pay other fees, et cetera. So that's years one and two. Future year costs, are the, those are your ranges, and that's anticipated to probably be operational and federal grant money. The reason being is the state has shown in the past that they're not willing to match us on any of our software costs that are administrative based. For example, like our office licensing costs or other systems, Great Plains today, that are not directly tied to a bus, they don't normally match. So in that situation, we're going to have to go after federal grant funds for this and operational budget money to cover the cost of the software. So what are our next steps? So the next steps for, uh, for this is we anticipate putting the RFP out on the street in June. Obviously, the month of July would be there for the, for the potential vendors to review and respond to us. Then Plant Moran will, will gather all those responses and they will an an analyze them to ensure that they meet the minimum requirements. GRTC then will review all the responses. Those vendors that we feel are a good match for us will be invited to participate in demos in October. With us hoping to come down to our final selection of who our preferred provider would be in November. At that point, we would pause and we would go through our grant application process for the funding, which is December to April. And then provided obviously that we were approved for the grant funds, which we anticipate we will be, then the project would kick off actually implementing the new system in July of 2022. And we anticipate it to be an 18 to 24 month implementation from start to finish to fully transition to the new system. And that concludes my report on this. I'm open to any questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tigert. Are there questions? Wow. Um, it's all a cloud to me, Rob. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so software as a service now, is that how we describe it? Yeah, that, that, is, that is the current term that's being uh, SAAS is the uh, the current term that's being populated out there. Uh -huh. And so um, there will be there will be some competition from different vendors um, yeah. for this. Yes, sir. There's multiple vendors. Obviously, we have Microsoft with their with their new product, but there's many different vendors. There's Oracle. There's all kinds of them out there in this space, and we anticipate a lot of responses. And the nice thing about that is. One of our focuses during the RFP process is finding those vendors that that play well in the public transit space. They have a good track record, a good history for that. Things like grant management, which we really need to ramp up our processes and obviously our finance and HR, we're, we're, we're focusing in and looking for those vendors that have a good track record in the public transit space, kind of like we did with Plant Moran. Kind of particular things that we do that other companies 
might Correct. not have to do it. Right. And way, so by, yeah. by going out to an open RFP, that gives us a broad scope of, of choices to choose from. And we have some significant um, information that um, that the potential sources of funds, which is federal and state grants, will be available for this? For the first two years in the implementation, yes. Moving Moving past that, it would be mostly federal and operational budget expense. And we won't do it if we don't get the money. Of course. Right, right, right. Uh, and, yeah. you know, of, yeah. of course, we would be coming back to you with those that information as we move forward in this process. Okay. And if I can jump in, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the state and federal grants we're talking about here are not necessarily a independent discretionary grants. Those would be embedded into our formula grants that we receive, our 5307, our 5339 federal grants, our uh, annual request that we make of the state to match those at 68 or 50 percent. So we're not looking for anything uh, different than what we normally do in our process. I think it's important to see that we are going after a significant amount of funds to improve our internal business operations and our effectiveness, and it will have an impact um, on our operational costs year over year. However, I believe it will also be offset by the, the efficiencies of not having to hire additional staff my own time, um, I spend a significant amount of time every year digging into and asking for analysis of finances that we have to do analysis on a spreadsheet base. Those efficiencies alone will be a considerable savings to the agency, to the corporation. Um, have any other Virginia um, bus companies um, gone this route at this point? Yes, um, um, HRT actually uh, went through this a few years ago and they utilized Plant Moran as their consultant for this same process. That was one of the reasons that we uh, chose them when we were going through the selection for the consultant. So there's been several agencies. I know that WMATA has, has gone through it as well, but the, the closest one to us is HRT and they've, they've seen great improvements and have nothing but great things to say about going, you know, their new system as well as Plant Moran, who we, you know, we already selected as our advocate. So um, Plant Moran's well familiar with navigating through these waters with agencies such as us. And would something like this make us less or more vulnerable to something like ransomware? Less vulnerable. Because, um, you know, ransomware, the common and, and obviously the pipelines in all of our minds and, and ransomware is something that keeps an, an IT director or a CIO up at night. And believe me, I lose a lot of sleep over it. But the most common way for those kinds of attacks to infiltrate your network is through your workers, your end users. And what they do is they click on a bad email or something along those lines. And then that software infiltrates your network and starts encrypting all your files with cloud based systems. If they were to click on that email and infect themselves, it can't really modify the back end files of a cloud system. It, you know, all you have is your front end interface. All that back end stuff is secure in the cloud separate. Right. It's it's um, usually in, in in basketball, if somebody throws someone a really great pass and make it so they can make an easy shot, you're supposed to at them. So that's what. <laughs> so those were assists to you, uh, yeah. Rob. Yes. <laughs> let you, let you, you, you did a great job with the dunk. Nicely done, George. <laughs> great assist. Further Chairman, questions? Mr. Chairman, if I may add a little bit to this. When I was at HRT um, uh, several, many years ago, they were looking at how to upgrade their, uh, their HR software and their financial software. And this was pre cloud-based becoming as big of a thing as it is now. And uh, the system that they had was probably a good decade old at that point, and to replace it was going to cost not in the million-dollar range, but if my, re my recollection is correct, it was at that time more of the $10 million range or more. Wow. Uh, the old way of doing things where you got floppy disks, you paid a lot of money up front, and then you, if you didn't keep it up to date, in 10 or 15 years, you got out of date, and then you had to put another you know, 10 or $15 million to update it. This system, the way Rob is looking at it, it has a, a smaller upfront cost than that, but then it has a higher annual cost. But when you look at it incrementally over the course of 10 or 15 years, we stay up to state, up to the state of the art with the industry. Um, our, our staff stays trained and we never get so far behind that we have to go through this you know, the way we used to uh, when computers first came out, which was 
I want to say so long ago, but it really wasn't, was it? And the nice thing is that through cloud-based systems, there's forced uh, staying current. So you don't have the ability to let your systems get stagnant because the provider is constantly updating their, their software and you don't have a choice. You just go along with it, so. Okay, and if and Rob, one last question. Um, I guess the, uh, the result of the RFP will be some type of COT solution, commercial off the shelf. We're not gonna try and have them build a proprietary solution just for GRTC, right? Correct. So it's the, all of these are off the shelf systems. Now all, all ERP systems, since they are such a large system, all of them require customization unique to each client, whether it's Oracle, PeopleSoft, Microsoft, they have to customize their processes and their systems and their fields to, to each client. And that's where you see the implementation costs, but the actual software is all going to be off the shelf mainstream. And we're looking for best in breed here. We're looking for not necessarily always going for top of the line, but it's the one that fits best for GRTC and, and is going to greatly in, impact us as far as process improvements. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Further questions? Let's see, do we need a motion on this or not? No, this was purely informational. <laughs> wow. All right, Rob. Well, thank you so much for your work. And, My pleasure. Uh, yeah. Um, it's really very interesting. All right, um, our next item is what? Uh, budget, Oper operations capital budget, John, Keisha. All right, I'm gonna, I'll start it out uh, and then Keisha will go do the capital piece. So I'm gonna share my screen this time. <laughs> um, slideshow. Okay, so that's visible on the screen, correct? Right. All right, so uh, basically, uh, we have we have briefed the members of the board on the uh, on the uh, proposed operating budget for fiscal year 22 at uh, the January meeting, and since then we've been working uh, on the budget. There's a couple assumptions that we're incorporating now here. So in this, on, on this slide here, uh, you'll see similar format that you've seen before where we're showing our actual expenditures from fiscal year 2017 through 2020. And then we're showing what the current fiscal year 2021 revised approved budget is. Um, the column, the fiscal year 2022 baseline, this is what we had shared um, with- John, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're still on slide one for us. There we go. Good, thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right, so going through that, the, the three, the four years of actual expenditures, the fiscal 21 or revised approved budget that we shared, and then this uh, uh, that we're operating under currently, and this fiscal year 2022 baseline, that's what we had um, shared with you in January. Um, so since that time, we've, uh, you know, this, the assumption for the baseline fiscal year 2022 had the assumption uh, that there were zero fares uh, in there, uh, assuming that it had, uh, had fares re uh, continuing. So what we've talked about in the recent months is, is transitioning back to a zero fare and utilize the Federal CARES Act funds to subsidize the, the money that, uh, the net money, uh, which is around $5.8 million, which would be, uh, you know, the actual fares that came in less the expenses to manage the fares, such as fare media and collection security and so forth as that. So um, accordingly, this the fiscal year uh, revised uh, baseline budget is, is, a, is a slight reduction, about 1.976 million, almost $2 million. Um, we are not done with the budgeting process at this point because there's a couple other items that we're, we're evaluating uh, that could have some impact and might add a little bit of money back in. But um, as we are right now, we, we, we plan to come back to the board in the month of June here to get the final budgetary presentation and approval for the beginning of our fiscal uh, 2022. Um, the, you know, this, this budget here also contemplates, you know, obviously, the mileage assumption for revenue miles for fiscal 2022 is at a little almost 6.2 million miles. And therefore, it's bringing in a cost per mile around nine dollars and eighty-eight cents, which is you know 
pretty much in line to slightly increase over the 2021 adopted budget rate. From the standpoint of um, this is the expense picture, and we, we, we know we were putting this together so we can share this with the members of the board. We'll send this out after this meeting. Um, and then on the revenue side, to complement that at $61.2 million, as you can see, as we have the CBTA revenue stream in at $20 million. Do you have a revenue slide there, John? Okay. Yes, I do, sir. It advances on my screen, but I have to physically advance the presentation. So it's a, <laughs> I thought they'd be in sync. I'm, I, the only thing that's out of sync is me this morning, it appears. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. But here's the revenue slide side of the, of the equation. And you can see that the, on the bottom, the CVTA revenue is in here is the consistent assumption of $20 million. Um, as you can see, uh, the line that's uh, three lines above it, Fair Replacement Cares Act, we originally had contemplated about $6.8 million in fares being received. Uh, it's been replaced by the net of $5.8 million being uh, funded through the Cares Act uh, funds. And you know, the, the obviously we're going down a net of $2 million roughly. So what we did was we, we also reflected here on the third line from the top, there are certain expenditures, um, operating expenses that are reimbursed by a grant from the state of, state of Virginia. And those are roughly about $1.1 million. Um, so we wanted to reflect those in there uh, as well as the DRPT revenues. Uh, we had some intel that possibly our, our dollar amount would go up by 2%. So we increased that from the 11.9 to 12.1. Uh, reflect that, that intel about the increase. And then the balance, we basically um, reduced the FTA contribution for revenues uh, to make to balance this out, knowing that going forward in the future years that we have, we're gonna have some sizable projects and initiatives that um, would also behoove us to, to, to save some of that money that we have from the FTA for future projects. Um, like I said, we're, we're still going through this process, but myself, uh, and, and, and my uh, colleagues, we've kind of gone through, you know, from in essence, kind of a zero based budget approach for about about 65% of the expenditures, taking a real hard look at it to make sure that we're capturing um, the appropriate operational efficiencies as well as um, looking at the next slide now, I'll, I'll advance it. Um, come on with me, there we go. You know, critical as we saw from the operating, the financial monthly op operating reports, Human capital is around 65% of our expenditures. So currently, this this budget is contemplating. Oh, sorry, the heading 2020 should be 20, 2022 there. Um, but the uh, it's contemplating headcount of 488 uh, employees, of which we have 452 or existing staff. We have 36 vacancies at this point, and I I think that that's uh, something that you've heard from uh, Tony, uh, from Tim, and and so forth, and Tony. Uh, making some challenges in the operations and, and maintenance aspects. So we're also looking at um, you know, a couple of studies to find out you know, if there's something we can do from the standpoint of compensation, are we competitive, uh, both in the, uh, the exempt and excluded ranks, as well as the, the uh, CBU ranks here to, to see how we can be the preferred employer to fill these vacant positions, which then will drive you know, on-time performance and our ability to put buses out on the street and, and you know and and so forth so um these are a couple other things we're just we're looking at here that, that we're going to come back and report back uh at the june meeting okay that um on your revenue side i mean your ex yeah go back to that one second what's that um operational uh reimbursement grant from drpt that that's uh it basically covers um it expenses and there's there's a couple individuals uh there's, I believe there's two individuals, one's uh, in planning and one's in transportation as well, that, that their, their salaries, uh, Social Security and Medicare are covered by the DRPT grant. And we have received that or it's anticipated? That's anticipated. All right. Any further questions on this work? Thank you very much. Um, we still have our, Mr. Yes. Keisha will, will go into the capital side of this now. So that was uh, operational, and now we actually have a report on the capital side. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen first. <laughs> Make sure that this works.
Okay. So in January, we came before the board and we provided a list of projects that, F, that GRTC wanted to move forward in an application to DRPT for projects, the all new projects. So this presentation is gonna go through what the results of that application was. So in February, we applied for projects totaling 28 million, asking for 19 million in state match. During the application process, the RPT with a budget of 84 million received $190 million worth of requests for state match throughout the state. In April, we got approval, preliminary approval that $26 million of our projects would be supported with $17 million of state match. That left a $2 million difference. So the executive staff at GRTC decided that $1 million of those projects were important to continue. So they will continue in FY22 without a state match. And the other million dollars worth of projects will be postponed until FY23 or later. Do you want to tell us what those were, Keisha? Yes. I'll be on the next slide. We'll I'll tell you what those are. Mm -hmm. So the this slide just shows the $26 million worth of projects that DRPT is going to support with state match. We'll go through the projects on a, next, on a later screen. This list of projects are the ones that GRTC executive staff felt were important enough to move forward with just federal and local funding. Those projects are the repair of our shop floors, our roof repairs on the administrative building, the IT software for administrative um, contracts. These are, as Rob stated, things like Great Plains, Green Shades, Microsoft Office. Those are not supported by DRPT match. So we'll be supporting those with federal and local only. Hard, hardware replacement, which is our computer, our computers, the monitors, phones, laptops, and the planning department for the shelters and amenities that Adrian went over on a previous uh, board meeting where we went out to the jurisdictions to see what type of amenities they needed. That was also not supported with a state match. So they were deemed necessary by our executive staff to move forward with just federal and local funding. So this is a breakdown of the projects, the new FY22 projects that we will be moving forward. Before I go any further, the funding that, we, that we're gonna be using does not include any of our previous projects like the transfer center, we already have those funds in place. And it also does not include capital cost of contracting, preventive maintenance and ADA assistance. Those are not included in this presentation. So the list of projects that we will be moving for, new projects that we will be moving forward in FY22 within facility, we will be upgrading the bus wash. We will, uh, as I said, do the shop floors, the roof repairs. Within fleet, we're gonna be replacing 30 fixed route buses and 18 paratransit vehicles. For IT, we will be putting Wi-Fi on the fixed route buses. We will be doing our maintenance agreements for operations and administration. Within the maintenance department, there's various state of good repair items that need replacing, forklifts, battery charging systems. There's also a gator that is involved in those projects. And within planning, the $4.6 million of planning is the um, shelters that we discussed and all of the studies we're gonna be doing, the studies on the neighborhood transfer center, the property study, next BRT, and the dedicated lane study. The projects that did not move forward and that are gonna be delayed, it was a million dollars. The majority of that, 850,000 of that is for the demolition of the church property. Once we do the study in FY22, we will come back in FY23 and use those results from the study to go forward with demolition of that building. The other items were related to fares within IT, since we're fare free at the moment, those were postponed until another decision is actually made regarding that. As usual with all the projects that meet the board's discretion, meets the board's 
um, DOA, Delegation of Authority, we will definitely be coming back with each of those projects as they move forward in the procurement process for your approval. Are there any questions, comments? What's the GRTC property study? And Adrian is here in case I don't give enough information. Uh, hold on. If I, I can jump in, I'll start keeping Okay, going. thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the property that I'm pointing behind me, you can't see the, the, the annex property we have adjacent to us. So we need to look at um, the, um, the use, how we want to uh, develop that property, how we want to use it, as well as how we're using the rest of this property. As we move forward with possible expansion, we don't have enough space for all the vehicles that we'll be purchasing, the staff that we'll be hiring. We have space over there, the parking. We need to look at how we have our adjacencies and our utilization of our current property, plus the property adjacent to us, so that we have a plan for the demolition and the development of that property that um, that is uh, um, reasonable with how we're using this as well to make sure that we grow efficiently and effectively with the space we, and property we have available to us. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, Ms. Reed. Are there any further questions um, on this? All right. Um, if uh, I, Mr. Campbell, yeah. if I, uh -huh. I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, make a comment to thank the CTD and, and DRPT for the amazing uh, support that they continue to provide GRTC. I believe this represents their understanding that we do have a growing and, their, and thriving program here and we do have significant growth needs in the future that they put a, a significant amount of uh, funding so that we could do the necessary studies to prepare for that growth, um, I think is a reflection of this board and our staff and the good work we're doing here. So I wanted to publicly acknowledge that support and be thankful for it. Thank you. Yeah, um, that it, it, it does feel like, uh, like folks really have faith in us and, uh, and that we're really moving ahead and that's, uh, that's exciting. All right, um, I think those are all for information, no action needed, but we do have something uh, we want to approve again, the Regional Public Transportation Plan. Adrian, what's going on here? Good morning again. Um, mm -hmm. I am bringing forward, you guys got information on kind of our recommendations last board meeting, but now bringing forward you know, for actual action item, and I'm gonna share my screen, um, the recommendations for the draft Regional Public Transportation Plan. All right, um, you already know this, but just gonna give a little bit of formal background. Um, GRTC is now the recipient of a dedicated uh, funding stream that was created by the Virginia General Assembly back in 2020, the establishment of the CBTA. Um, and with the uh, recipient of the funds, GRTC is required to annually submit a regional public transportation plan. Um, the requirement is to work with the MPO that so we have since January been working with several jurisdictions, the MPO, um, and a lot, several other transit-related agencies to develop um, this draft plan. This effort was led by the consultants we hired, Michael Baker and Associates, and Jared Walker. Um, we, of course, know that this did not kick off, like I said, until January, and this plan is um, going to be hopefully approved in June. It's a very constrained timeline. So with this, this is definitely the inaugural um, effort of this plan. We plan on going through a much more detailed, longer process um, through regional transit planning in the next year to come. And I'm sure it will continue and grow um, as we continue and grow as well. Uh, Rob already went over, not Rob, sorry, John already went over this, but our FY22 operational expenses um, at the time I draft this was about $63.2 million. That, as you have seen through his presentation, has continued to be refined as we go towards the zero based budgeting and continue to um, refine the operational dollars. Uh, Keisha just also gave her presentation and roughly about $30 million is estimated for capital expenses. I do have things that are just happening this year, um, not just things that we applied for such as the transit center, um, the temporary one downtown, so my dollars are a little bit higher. Um, that's what we're projecting to spend in FY22 for these projects. Uh, so kind of just a highlight of our priorities, we have four bullet points. Um, we want to ensure the stability and maintenance of our transit operations in FY21. That's our, our first goal. 
uh, prioritize capital requirements, maintain assets in state of good repair with several of the projects, um, or all of the projects that Keisha just went over and a few more, um, advance planning studies for operational capital mobility priorities and needs in the RVA region. So this includes um, microtransit studies um, as well as um, any others that kind of fit the need um, of our service as we look at other modes. Um, and then prepare for expansion and innovation initiatives in FY23. So that's just referring to the expansion priorities we already listed with the jurisdictions, but incorporating that into the study above, um, that will be our FY 2023 regional plan that we'll develop next year. So a little bit more just looking at the funding for FY 2022. Um, we are anticipating for the FY 2021 accruals for GRTC from the 15% to be about $20.3 million. Um, of that, um, John went over this already as well, but $200,000 has already kind of been earmarked or allocated, um, approved for the study we're doing this year, the current regional public transportation plan. So of that, that's $20.1 million that we would like to use towards operating capital plans to spend on FY22. So again, we were planning on using the FY21 um, accruals to pay for our operating capital expenses for FY2022. Um, GRCC is estimating for operational and capital expenses to be about $21.2 million. So looking back at that paragraph above, 20.1 and 21.2, 21.2 is a little bit higher. Um, so whatever the net difference is, GRTC is re recommending to use um, federal relief dollars to um, fill the gap. And just kind of reiterate, but put dollar figures between, for those four bullet points above. Um, we plan on maintaining existing service, 20.1 million. The capital needs is roughly about 700,000 um, to fund the regional study for on-demand services or microtransit is $200,000. And then to do the FY 2023 regional public transportation plan, which will be done annually, um, is $200,000. So with all that together, again, that's the 21.2 million. Um, and again, broken down in table form, that shows roughly, um, and again, working on efficiencies, so 1.1 million is that, that gap right now and looking to use those COVID relief funds to fill that using the FY21 dollar. So as far as the FY22 um, accruals that we'll be getting uh, starting in July, we are recommending to put that in um, a reserve that is restricted and those dollars will be used for the next transit year. Um, and again, looking at about 2021 20, million probably towards maintenance of service, and the rest will be used for prioritization of those various studies that we work through in FY 2023. Um, so the formal recommendation coming to the board, um, staff recommends that the board of directors support the GRTC FY 2022 Regional Public Transportation Plan and direct GRTC CEO to advance the plan to the full CBTA board for approval of use of the FY 2021 CBTA dollars to fund the estimated need of 21.2 million for copper operating and capital needs which we've identified above, um, and the placement of the FY22 CBTA funds projected about $28.1 million into a reserve for approvals by the GRTC and CBTA board for the next year. Any questions? So could I have a motion for this and then we'll discuss it or ask questions on it? Somebody so move it. All right, thanks, Second. Gary. Second, okay. So thank you, Adrian. That's questions, um, Adrian, this, um, the regional transportation plan also includes our existing operational structure, correct? That's the root structure. Yes. Um, that is the um, 20.1 million support existing operations. Right? And, and that's quite specific as to where the buses are going. It's our current routes that are out there today, our current service levels, um, uh, also at the current, at the pre COVID levels is what we're looking at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that, it would not preclude us from doing modifications uh, that are the cost neutral modifications for efficiencies. We wouldn't be stuck doing a route, for example, that um, that was performing poorly if we could redirect those funds to one that was performing better. But it is to maintain our service levels essentially as they are at essentially the level that they are as long as they remain effective as they are. Yeah, the reason I asked it is that um, in the future that what that will include will be expanded routes that they will in fact be approving at the CVTA level. Right, it'll be right. incorporation of the next plan will yeah. prioritize those right. and that those, it'll be a 
probably an expansion um, row right there to show what that increase is. That yeah. just and, the, and they will care where it's going is what I'm saying. Right now, they, um, they're they saying, do what you're doing. But in the future, we'll be looking at all those expansion uh, things and prioritizing them that um, that you guys have been working on. Well, that's our recommendation yeah. um, to the board at this point in time, as we worked with the jurisdictions and realize our need, as well as the revenue changes um, with the jurisdictions to just make sure at least where baseline is continuing. Right. We do have, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have continuing on and ongoing conversations with each of the CBTA board members and their jurisdictions to prioritize what their needs are. There has been concern expressed at the CBTA board uh, and, um, and separately that that we haven't been able to capture all of the priorities and the needs throughout the region, which is one of the reasons why we are not proposing doing an expansion this year, but just the, the top priority of maintaining the service that we have now and studying the needs so that we can effect, effectively capture what the region desires, their priorities, and then put them in a ranked priority to be able to fund them next year and beyond. Further questions or comments? All right, so it's been moved and seconded that uh, that we approve um, this regional, this, um, what is it, a transportation plan? Regional public transportation plan uh, to be uh, sent to the CBTA uh, policy board. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, come on, come on, folks. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's get excited. And um, <laughs> congratulations on accomplishing this, uh, Ms. Torres. This is um, <laughs> this has been quite an effort, and it's our first shot at uh, having this go before the board. And um, I commend uh, watching that meeting. Uh, actually, I think it's going to be a live meeting when they finally get to this in June. Um, I don't know where they're having it. Do you, uh, Adrian? I don't. Do. I do not. Yeah, Julie, you'll be at that. Um, but uh, it's worth watching because this is a it's a new organization and um, they're inventing everything. And so uh, this is our this is our shot at it. Thank you so much for this um, and for all the work that's gone in on it. It's approved. Oh, all in favor say aye. Oh, yeah, we did that. All right. So now Chief Executive Officer's report. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Um, at 941, we actually might, uh, if I can keep this short, end this meeting in under two hours. So I think that is a, a quite the accomplishment for us considering everything that we've gone through in the past year and a half. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, members of the board, a, a quick repeat of what Tim mentioned with the COVID activities, we are still seeing some positivity amongst our staff, but we are quarantining that those rates have significantly dropped as we have uh, seen the vaccinations come higher and higher with our staff. We're about 50% of uh, vac vaccinated staff, and we will continue to see that grow, and we're continuing to work on having an on-site vaccine clinic. Still have not been successful in getting someone here, but I've had some, some bites, and I hope to have something positive to report shortly within the next month on getting on-site vaccinations here, not just for COVID, but our annual vaccines for the flu as well. Wanted to acknowledge and thank Bon Secours. We were able to go out uh, yesterday at one of our stops in Richmond, on the east side of Richmond, to highlight and to celebrate the investment Bon Secours is putting into transit and mobility. When they went out in 2018, 2016, and did a community Im impact assessment and a health assessment, they identified that there were critical needs and connections to support our community's health based on uh, their ability to have mobility and connectivity to essential resources, to jobs, to healthcare, to food. Uh, through that partnership, they provided uh, a significant amount of money uh, to DRTC that was matched with some federal and state funding and was supported also by the City Council of Richmond, uh, Council President Newbill to put those shelters out, 14 new shelters in the east side of Richmond. And I am very proud and grateful that we are able to put these amenities out for our riders. However, I think you saw that we did have um, a need for additional 
shelters and additional seating throughout our system. We did not, uh, even though I am, am so thankful to the state for their support, we did not get the support for added shelters at this time. Um, would they have limited resources? We will have to look internally to use our federal uh, grants and to also look for private partners to continue to support this. We have 5% of our 1,600 stops with shelters. We only have about 20% with seating. And for those people who have stood at, um, uh, at a transit stop on a beautiful day, staying there for 10 minutes is still difficult uh, for the healthy of us. Uh, and if you stand there on a day that's rainy or snowing or in the summer, it is miserable. And um, I would go so far as to say it can even feel very inhumane has a, a specific impact on our individual minds as well as our community health. So we will be looking to put more shelters out and we will be looking for our public partners to help us uh, identify the places to put those to support our communities and to, to maintain those stops. We'll be looking to the private sector to step forward and sponsor these uh, new initiatives to expand sidewalk infrastructure. Uh, to allow for um, greater property easements so that we have the accessibility to put the shelter pads, the shelters, and the benches in place. And to look to the private community, uh, the private sector to do it, not just where they are currently building, but also to consider the expanded community adjacent to where they're located, or even across town, where they might not have a footprint, but where their customers and their employees live and use transit to get to their services. And we also need to partner specifically with our community members to adopt these stops and shelters to help keep them beautiful, help us know when we're falling short or where the shelters might need some uh, additional love. While we have staff that goes out to try and maintain them, we do have limited staff to manage 1,600 bus stops and the shelters that we're trying to expand. It will be our combined regional commitment of all of our partners, public, private, and community uh, membership to to really commit to our mobility and our accessibility needs, that where these needs overlap together, we'll be able to find the gap, the inequity of the service, and make sure that we have that continuous um, service for all of our community members. We talked a little bit about the Colonial Pipeline, the cyber attack. Uh, just to reiterate, this did not affect us. We primarily use CNG and diesel for our fleet, primarily CNG. We do use some gas for our non-revenue fleet for our supervisor's vehicle, but we do have a locked-in rate, and we were guaranteed that rate through the um, through the shutdown. Uh, so we were fine through it. There was never a shortage for us. Uh, in fact, I would hazard to say that the shortage was um, was generated by the media. Probably not politically correct to say that, but there it is. Uh, we will come back with the final budget document in June. Uh, I we continue to look at that zero-based budgeting. We continue to look at zero fares. We continue to look at our current salary structure and our, uh, our lack of ability to get new staff here and how we will use our state and capital grants to support our operating needs. All of those will continue to be uh, mixed in with our assessment of our budget. Uh, I am committed to driving down as much as possible our costs while making sure that we are able to efficiently and effectively put service out. Uh, I, I expect that while we did talk about a $63 million budget previously and we have been able to push that down through our zero-based budgeting as we get our current, we have a draft study and now looking at our market wage rates and salaries suggesting that we have many positions that are well below market rate and even our entry-level positions which isn't significantly below market rate, we need to have a discussion about whether the market rate for bus drivers entry-level is sufficient for ongoing operations and to attract and maintain, retain new operators. So we'll be looking at all that. So you might see an upward uh, adjustment of the, the budget again for evaluation next month and for adoption. I look forward to bringing that back at that time. As you heard throughout this meeting, I, I tried to, to jump in on occasion uh, when we had changes to the agenda. Uh, we are constantly looking for ways to improve, constantly looking for opportunities to streamline these meetings, even though I'm my report here is taking longer than I had hoped. Um, these agendas need to be effective and efficient for you, give you sufficient and detailed information on the status of our operations activities that you can have the information for key policy directions and updates that have performing. Uh, I appreciate any feedback you can give me to, uh, to continue 
not only streamline but provide uh, effective communications to you. I want to make sure that we do bring you news of recognitions and achievements when we're doing a job well done. Um, if you have any thoughts about where we're getting too much information or not enough information or where we can dive a little bit deeper, uh, I really would appreciate that feedback so we can keep these meetings very focused and effective and, um, and short. Uh, and finally, as we talked about originally, we do need to have a conversation about when would be the appropriate time for the board to start meeting in person again. Uh, we, we know that we're 50% vaccinated in our staff. We know that the state mandates are coming down regarding how we can come together, the social distancing and the masks for vaccinated people. But I would remind the board that under the federal requirements, we still have a mask mandate for public transportation until September the 13th. That includes that masks are fully required regardless of vaccination on buses, trains, and airplanes. And I would hesitate to suggest we meet um, in person while our staff and our riders are still under that mask mandate. Um, if, we, if you do want to come back prior to that time, we will look for a, another location where we can have proper social distancing and ventilation to do so safely and effectively. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, if there are no questions, that concludes the CEO's report for May. Anybody want to say anything to the CEO? Um, okay, my report is thank you. Um, good work. Uh, company looks good, and we appreciate all the work you're doing, and uh, especially the way in which you're trying to keep us in the loop so we can be effective um, as, uh, as helping you. Any further comments? Um, if yes, not, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Yeah, Bryce. And I should have brought this up during the um, during the maintenance report, but um, you know, and once again, in light of what happened with the pipeline, and you know, it seems that things are going to be getting back to normal soon. Um, I I just would like uh, just a little background on how you know um, that type of issue, that type of uh, lack of supply um you know affects grtc um especially you know with us being on cng and how that works it's one of those things i know the answer but i wanted i think it needs to be said and it needs to be um out there for the um tens of singles of people that are out there watching this meeting right now so <laughs> and i can <laughs> So can we get a little background on um, how we are made possibly isolated from these types of um, emergencies? Um, I'm gonna to kind of throw out that Tanya um, Thompson and Tony Bird should be on alert that I'm about to throw this at them. So if they can <laughs> think about how to respond to this, I'm giving a little bit of tap dancing. There you go. <laughs> That's the ball. George, I'm going to try to answer your question as best as I can. Um, first of all, the gas, uh, a lot of the gas, the vehicles that use gas are, are, are support vehicles. Um, and then secondly, we contract for fuel delivery services. And because we contract for the fuel delivery services, we take priority. Um, so when we were informed of possible shortages, um, we worked with PAPCO, who is our supplier, um, and they ensured us that we were fine. Um, so there were, we didn't, there were no delays, there were no issues whatsoever last week. Fortunately, everything came back online um, this weekend, last weekend, excuse me. And um, so we weren't, they were concerned that there may be shortages if it continued into the next week. Um, but fortunately, we did not incur any issues. Um, our gas is purchased um, on, by the rack, which means we get updated prices weekly. So if anything, we may have seen a rise in gas prices. But other than that, that's the only way we were affected. Thank you. If I, is that pretty if much I mean. everything, Tony? <laughs> Yes, 95 of our vehicles are CNG, compressed natural gas with a fixed route, and the complete paratransit side is CNG. We only carry 47 buses that are diesel at this time. 
Uh, Mr. Braxton, um, sure. so I think that to be to be perfectly blunt here, we weren't so concerned about the gas crisis at this point for putting operations on the street. The biggest concern was as there was a run, and regardless of how it was driven, there was a run on the gas tanks for our community, which meant that if our operators were unable to get gas, they might not have been able to come. So while we we could have still maintained service with the amount of gas we had, we might not have been able to get our operators here if that had continued to run and if there had been a true ongoing shortage, which we knew that there was not. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Mr. Braxton, because actually the statistics I've been following said that our viewership went up by 10,000 people during the last 15 minutes. So that's very good. Um, are there any further questions? Uh, great answers, Tony and Tanya. That was uh, very impressive. Okay, if not, this meeting of the Board of GRTC is adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. See you.